You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 167. If you run, you can't see what's coming up behind you. Frank Castle. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Hey guys, now today I am excited to bring you our guest. His name is John Polono, and he is the writer, director, and co-star of the new film, Small Engine Repaired. And it premiered at South by Southwest, and I had the pleasure of watching this film. And I got to tell you, it it just rocked me. It, 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 it's, it, it got underneath the skin. It got through the armor, through the shrapnel. It is... Uh, definitely not a movie that is for the weak at heart in many ways. If you're a father with a daughter, Jesus Christ, be careful watching this film because it's going to hit you hard. Um, it's based on his uh, best-selling play that he had been uh, performing for years. And uh, it's just a remarkable, remarkable film. Now, John has been in the business for a while as an actor and writer. He wrote the film Stronger with Jake Gyllenhaal and is currently working with Todd Phillips on the Hulk Hogan biopic over at Netflix, among many other projects that he's working on. He even got to work with the legendary Frank Darabont on a show called Mob City as an actor, and that story is worth the price of admission alone of how Frank Darabont works on set and everything. But John and I just had this amazing conversation about the business, about the creative process, uh, what his favorite films are, his favorite directors and writers, how he constructs scenes, how he works with character and dialogue, what was like the worst day of the shoot and what he learned from it and so many other things. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with John Polano. I'd like to welcome to the show, John Polano. How you doing, John? I'm doing all right. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. It's uh, any day above above the ground nowadays is a good day. Dude, I know, right? With the uh, we've lowered the bar pretty much. Oh, the bar has been lowered since 2019. That's for damn. That's for damn sure. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, we're going to be talking. Pleasure. I, uh, I'm a big fan of the of the podcast. Thanks. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, you know, we we're going to go down the road a little bit about uh, your your remarkable journey in the business. And, uh, and, and you're a, you're an East coaster. Uh, yeah. so I always love talking to East coasters. 
because I'm being an East Coast. There's a different energy with East Coasters, even yeah. though you're even though you're West Coast now, as I was. Uh, but um, it's so where it's, you spent the formative years, I think. Is I think is it is, and it never leaves you. It never. It never does. And you can live in LA for the next fifty years. I I, I had a I had a, a good friend of mine who was a first AD, worked on every big movie you can imagine. Twenty years, he raised in New York, but until he was seventy, he was still talking like you know. I want to go to the door. He had the accent. It's he had just, the attitude. It's comfort. It's it's what you're used to. You do it. You know. I mean, I, I I've been here about twenty years, and I uh, you know it hit me. You know, the first like five or six, I was like, you know, I'm not I'm not really here. This is what. <laughs> And then you kind of like, I kind of love it. I mean, California is great, but California is like a melting pot. It's like people from all over. And I mean, like most of my friends are from the Northeast, from New York and Boston. And I mean, it just happens you gravitate towards that. I mean, like I said, my wife's in Dallas, but you know, when we first were dating and stuff, she'd be like, will you stop yelling? And I'm like, I'm not yelling. <laughs> that's love. <laughs> that, that's how you communicate. And yeah. then uh, but you realize when you're from people back home, you're all like that, you know? So it's just, uh, it's, you attract birds of a feather, I guess. And then eventually all, uh, uh, all East Coasters uh, go down to Miami to uh, to retire. So that's kind of... Uh, I guess that's it. Maybe <laughs> Isn't that the law? I think that's the law. I think it? it is the law. <laughs> so, uh, so, man, how did you get into the business, bro? How did you get started? Um, Like, how back do you want to go? I mean, uh, so... I mean, not the womb, but right. like... <laughs> I mean, look, I always loved uh, stories and movies. And I, as a kid, I was a voracious reader. And I started writing, you know, short stories uh, pretty young. I was obsessed with Stephen King. I like read everything he, he wrote. And I, I don't know, I just sort of had a knack for it. And then, you know, started doing that kind of thing. And then um, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to make movies. And I, you know, it was a dream of mine. Then I, I went to University of New Hampshire. It was pretty much all I could afford. But I did an exchange to NYU. And you do uh, you for a whole summer. It's like two semesters worth of, of filmmaking classes. And I was just like, I, it was the biggest epiphany of my life. Being in the city, being surrounded by such a diverse group of artists for the first time in my life. I was around people I could just sit down with and we could talk about movies and, mm -hmm. and stuff for hours, like endlessly. So I was no longer the sort of having to convince my peer group to, to go watch a movie with me or talk about it. I was just with people and, you know, living and breathing. And I was like, this is what I want to do, you know, for the rest of my life. And, you know, I, I went a very circuitous way. I graduated from college. I lived in Colorado for a couple of years with uh, with a girl. We lived like in a trailer park and I wrote a bunch of terrible screenplays. And then I moved out to L.A. with those in, you know, in my backpack. And, um, you know, they sucked. I was writing movies that were derivative of movies. So I, I didn't quite, you know, like, here's my Indiana Jones. Here's my, you know, whatever. The weapon. Here's right. my exactly the weapon right. type stuff. And, and so then I started to take acting classes and I got more involved in theater and I've been a, you know, in a playwright for, you know, 15, about 10, 15 years now. And theater was really what, how I discovered my voice and it sort of amplified all of that stuff. And, and then in theater and working as a playwright, having play after play produced and sort of living in that world, I just, yeah, developed my voice as a writer. So then when I started to write screenplays, I had that sort of skill set that wasn't derivative of other movies. It was based on the lessons I had learned in theater, which were, you know, character and drama and conflict and, and pro, you know, provoking an audience and really going to these daring, scary places. And so when I started to use that uh, in screenwriting, my you know screenwriting career sort of took off. Uh, and then I've just sort of been juggling the two ever since. But you, but you started, uh, but you started acting a little bit before. I mean, you, well, you, your big break wasn't your big break or your first notable role with uh, Frank Darabont in Mob City. Yeah, that was uh, coincidentally he saw me in Small Engine Repair, the play in 2011. Right. And I had known Frank when I first moved to LA. I worked at the mailroom at Castle Rock Entertainment, and then <laughs> which was really cool. I mean, look, I'm like That's in my mid twenties. I'm like, this is great. I made wonderful friends. And then uh, a friend of mine in the mailroom, this guy, Phil Santani, who's a great guy, uh, still friends with him. He was taking acting classes at this place. And I, you know, I'd acted in NYU and done it. I kind of had like a, you know, of the bug, but I kind of was too, you know, so much of my life and sort of my upbringing was being sort of closeted about my artistic side mm -hmm. and, and being afraid to sort of in the culture that I was in or I was subscribed to, 
like uh, I, I was too vulnerable and I just didn't have feel like I had that support system. I had to kind of keep it buried down. So that was I was still in a I, I probably lost 10 years of my career by being too much of a chicken shit to just say, you know what? This is what I am. I am an artist. You know what it is like you're from mm-hmm. Queens. It's like that tough guy. Like hey, oh, my dad, my father was like, you're going to do what? <laughs> like what, yeah. what kind of where are you going to make money? Like they had he was a factory worker. Totally. He's just hundred percent. Yeah. Exact same thing. Yeah. Exact same thing. And I had, you know, I've had, you know, a hundred jobs in my life, manual labor, construction, irrigate, you know, everything, landscaping, you name it, because that I was afraid to say, Hey, look, this is what I want to do. So I took those acting classes. That's sort of how I met it. And then I, uh, um, but then I, I became an assistant to the the head of PR and it was like this beautiful family to be part of. Um, I'm still friends with all those people. And I, so in the PR department, Frank Darabont made a bunch of movies at Castle Rock. So I just got to know him as like, you know, the 27 year old guy who parks his car and talks about movies. He was awesome. He was, you know, one of those filmmakers who you could just talk to. And I, you know, I just got to know him through there. So then when I was in this play and he was obviously knew John Bernthal from Walking Dead, he came and saw it and he was like, Hey, I didn't know you were an actor. You know, I'm such a, you know, I love your, that you wrote it. I love it. And, uh, yeah, and they brought me in on that, um, pilot and, uh, yeah, I just got cast in that. I think someone else got cast over me, this Irish actor and he like couldn't get his green card. It was like, I was pinned for it and then they let me go. They cast this guy and then they called and they're like, Hey, you're in it. And I was like, this is amazing. So we shot that pilot, but it kind of sat there for a long time. And then we shot those other episodes. I mean, that was such an amazing experience and you know, so, I just adore Frank. He's so great. So how did you have uh, connections in the visa department to get that actor kicked off the phone? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I wish I did, you know, man. I wish I had. No, but what is? I mean, I have to ask because I'm such a huge Frank Darabont fan. I mean, I mean, everyone at the, sh- in the listens to the show understands my obsession with Shawshank Redemption, uh, and oh. considering it's one of the greatest cinematic experiences I've ever had, and continue to have one of the best screenplays I've ever written. What is it yeah. like working with? Like, you know, I guess you already knew him a bit because you had been working with him, and you know, as the 27 year old who parks his car. But yeah. it's another thing being directed by by a giant like that. Well, you know, there's different directors have different ways of doing it. Um, that was one of the things I learned that it's like, what kind of director are you? And, you know, Frank, he does the work on the page. Um, and he worked, you know, in, in the case of Mob City it was written by a bunch of different people, but it was like his vision and he was very visual. And so performance wise, you know, he kind of let you do your thing. Like, I, I feel like I'm a different director than that. I like to get in the weeds with the actors more, but he's not intimidating. He's a super cool guy. He fucking loves film, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. He's a student of it. And, and the really interesting thing about Frank, which isn't like a lot of directors I've worked with, is that if you're like, hey, you know, my cousin's in from out of town. He wants to see how the movie. He's like, bring him in. <laughs> like I was working as like a freelance PR guy at the time still to pay the bills because I had a, a child and, you know, we were making shit work. I, like I said, if that was a period of my life where I had like four jobs. One of them was Mob City. But, you know, and it paid good, but not enough to raise a family in L.A. You know, you're always waiting for that bigger break. So but I was I brought all of the 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 PR guys I was working with and gals like these, this another group of friends I had. And he's like, yeah, he brought them all around the monitor. They're all like, I can't believe this. He completely is disarming. He loves to show you this and ask people questions. Like he loves the process so much. He's very inviting. So you, whenever, if he has a minute, you can always ask him questions about the camera lenses and this and that, you know, at mob city, he was starting to go more digital, which he didn't think he would. And he would talk endlessly about that. I mean, the guy is just like so open about all that and, and, and eager to share. That's awesome, you know? man. That's always yeah. – it exceeds it's always your awesome. expectations on how cool he is with that particular uh, you know, thing. I've, I've heard he's been – I heard from other people who've worked with him. He's very cool, but it's nice to continuously hear that he is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he, totally. You know, I, I, and I think he's very visual and that's sort of his lane. Uh, you know, I think – if you're an actor who likes to be super collaborative in terms of your ideas of the characters and the performance and, you know, I have this idea about the scene and, you know, he's not necessarily that director, but he's painting beautiful pictures and he knows the story and he knows it. So it's like, you gotta, you gotta go with the flow. I mean, it's just all different kinds, you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, if you're working with Clint Eastwood, you're working with Clint Tarantino, they're very different flavors of director. Right. <laughs> very, very different. Yeah, no, totally. And, and you know, again, that was sort of I was very intimidated to direct a movie. And one of my things was like I was fortunately able to shadow so many directors that I that I really admire. And I saw, well, 
I had the opportunity of being the actor with them and saying, oh, OK, how, how can I communicate that? And, and additionally, some incredible theater directors as well. <clears throat> so I, I and I felt like, you know, it's such a godsend to be able to see someone like you're saying Frank Darabont work and sort of cherry pick some of the stuff he does to be like, yeah, I think I want to try that. And some of the stuff you're like, OK, that's not the director I am. But, you know, um, Frank, I think his direction starts on the page. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's a writer by the first. time you're there, yeah, yeah he, he he's a writer, and I mean, they're so you know, they're so connect, interconnected in many ways. But you know, read his script, you kind of know what he wants from that character. Now, when you were uh, you you know, you're hustling as an actor, uh, and then you're writing some screenplays. I'm assuming you haven't written uh, Lethal Weapon Seven at this point. You've gone past no. that. Uh, <laughs> I would write that. Are you I would. I, I was about to say I would enjoy having you write Lethal Weapon Seven. That would be in- interesting to say the least. But uh, so you start writing. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how Stronger came to be? Yeah. So you know. Small Edge Repair at that time as a play was like my writing sample, you know, what they used to get you in the door. And I had just signed with CAA and they were like, you know, I had written some screenplays. And I, at that point I had had some legit screenwriting jobs, but the door wasn't sort of kicked open. So Stronger, I had known the Mandeville guys, especially this guy Alex Young, Todd Lieberman, producers over there. They were familiar with my work. I had had enough plays going on that they got to know you. You know, you have a general meeting and you say, hey, look, you know, I have a play running. Would you want to check it out? So they go see it. So they were like, especially Alex, who was the junior sort of producer at the time, he he kind of knew my voice and he was looking for something. So Stronger came by, the book sample they had. It hadn't been published yet. They were trying to find a writer. It was a, it was a really fortuitous situation because – just coincidentally, one of my favorite all-time screenwriters, Scott Silver, was a producer on it. And his role was he was going to – they were going to hire somebody a little more junior. And Scott was going to kind of, as sometimes happens in these things, you know, kind of oversee it. Like we like this guy's voice. He's never ne- necessarily written a studio movie of this size. We're going to kind of help mentor him a little bit, which Scott does a lot and he's amazing at that. So – you know, look, I, I grew up 20 minutes from where the characters take place. So, you know, I think it was a shoe in and, and enough of my plays, which had taken place in that sort of those neighborhoods, it was just a, a really good fit. So I read the book, I had my take on it. And then, you know, I came up with my pitch and, and I had never done that quite thing before. But like these guys were incredible. You know, we sold it to, to Lionsgate. And then, you know, I uh, spent a ton of time with uh with jeff bowman and his friends and everything and then you know and then i wrote it and then i wrote a first draft that i think really captured like the rough scruffy heart of of the story that it ends up being and and then you know working close with the producers and and more importantly with scott really saying okay well this is you know this scene's working this is not so structure theme really nailing down on that writing 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 and then eventually you know it just kind of clicked and it became you know that script then being on the blacklist and all that stuff even before the movie was produced that script made a big enough splat i mean look sometimes you write a screenplay and the producer takes it and it's under lock and key and they they you know give it out to a director reading but like you know i mean i have scripts scripts i'm certain i've written that maybe you know 15 people have read outside of the company i wrote it for stronger was one of those that it just went out on the circuit interesting so that's and, and that's how and that's and that's how i got involved with the blacklist yeah because blacklist is like you know uh junior execs assistance everybody like reading it it was just it caught fire that year and you know that even like i said before it was made i started to have buzz and people wanted to hire me because they read the script and they're like holy shit and then you know obviously when you make a movie it brings you to a whole other level um but you know that's sort of how the, that took fire but just as importantly from that relationship with scott he and i just really clicked and he's from Worcester, massachusetts And we've gone on to write a whole bunch of scripts together. And, you know, that was as important in terms of my education as being a studio screenwriter as anything is like getting to work with him on all this stuff and, you know, how I like to approach it, how he does. And and again, just like working with a director, you kind of cherry pick. I've always tried to be humble and open to that. And, you know, Scott is like, you know, he's one of a kind and he has his way of doing it. And then when we do it together. So I, I really you know, gotten so much out of that. Um, well, what, and that's ask, 
approach as many of these sort of collaborations as possible. Let me ask you, what's the when you were working with Scott, when you were just brought in on Stronger, what's the biggest lesson you learned from him as far as either structure or character or approach to the craft? Because you were still, you've been writing for a long time, but this was kind of like you, you were starting to get into deeper waters here in Hollywood. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, when you write a play, there is, you know, you're, you're in a good way, you're limited by the constraints of theater. Right. You know, whereas a movie, you can do anything. You can do exterior of the universe, whatever. There's like too many options. So sometimes initially that's intimidating. So theater by nature of it, you're a little bit more contained. I, I would say the thing that Scott initially even having written a draft and knowing like what it's about was the specificity of theme really being disciplined and being like, he's like, you know, what, what, what is this about? You know, in using that theme as sort of a prism to, to inform the rewrites, the structures, what scenes stay, what doesn't like to really be disciplined about, about that. And that was something I think I was doing to some extent subconsciously, some way consciously, but it was always easy to be like, oh, this is a really cool tangent, which, you know, my whole thing in theater was always like, is it, is it uh, deepening the character? Is it really funny? Is it thematic? Is it moving the plot? Is it doing all those things? But, and especially in a film, it's like really the economy of making sure it's all cohesive in, in one vision. And although you may not know my theme reading something or anyone's theme, it, it's clear when there's sort of an intelligent design behind that. And I felt maybe that doesn't work for everybody. You know, certainly I grew up listening to, you know, being obsessed with Tarantino and Scorsese and hearing their work process, especially Tarantino saying like, you know, there's that famous quote he has when he's writing Reservoir Dogs that he's like, Mr. Blonde took that straight razor out of his thing while I was writing and he surprised me. I didn't do that. So I, I still <laughs> like to create, especially in theater or I, I want the characters and situations to surprise me, but it has to be like, let's not go off the reservation. Let's continue saying what we need to say. And <laughs> That served me very well and continues to. I, I always find it fascinating. And I know, I know, you know, in my own writing over the years and with with writers I speak to, I always, always am fascinated when they say something like Tarantino just said, like, oh, all of a sudden the, right. you know, the, and when I was first writing, first coming up with stories and things like that, it would be so difficult. I'm like, when, I'm, when I hear things like that, I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't like, they're not talking. These characters aren't, I'm not, I'm not just writing down what someone's saying in my head. Like, I, and then later, and I don't know what it is that maybe it's uh -huh. being open, maybe, you know, wherever this magic dust comes in from our creativity right. flows through us. I, I don't know. I opened the door and all of a sudden when I did start writing, I was like, oh. Oh, I kind of see, I get glimpses of it. I'm not nearly, obviously, it's as open as Tarantino is. Right. Uh, I don't think anybody is. But is that kind of the process with you too? Like, did you, I mean, do you see those I, characters talk to you? Absolutely. I mean, look, I think taking a deep dive in theater, being an actor, being on stage, performing other people's words, my own words, uh, was instrumental in the sort of progression of an artist. So when I write, I know how to write for actors I know as an actor, I just know that I know how to like I'm in the bathwater, you know, so, you know, there are actable characters and then there are characters that are just servicing the plot. So really sort of interesting analogy. When I first started to write plays for my friends and for, you know, my wife who was in my uh, my future wife who was in my acting class, we started a theater company. We did this like theater has brought me pretty much all my core relationships, but You'd be writing something and, you know, in the back of your mind, I'm like, okay, I'm writing this play. Is this character significant enough that I'm going to be able to get my friend to commit to it, work for free, carry equipment around, take work off, yeah. do all this shit. And it's, if it's not valuable to them as an actor, they're not going to do it. And I found that sort of philosophy works, meaning every character I try to write, you know, sometimes there's like day players. They just got to say little things, basically extras, but you want them to have some meat because I know how actors are in terms of give them juicy subtext and they will bring it to a whole other level. If you don't give them subtext, I don't care how good of an actor there is, they are. They're just going to invent something or just kind of float. So I do think 
I, especially in my early theater writing, I would experiment with having characters one way and then suddenly, yeah, if you write a character who is like, they take a, a joint out of their pocket and they start smoking. But they're, you know, but if you set that character up as like a 55 year old, you know, a school teacher or whatever, well, that's surprising. Mm-hmm. But that actor will then stitch that into the entirety of their performance, you know. So you're like creating these moments that will be organic to it. But it better suit the, it better damn well suit the story and suit other things. But I like stories in which the characters can continue to surprise me and continue to do things within the reality of what they are. Do you know what I mean? But I mm-hmm. like. I, I mean, I love how Taren, I like my favorite uh, stories have characters where you're a little bit unsure of what are they going to do. So so I like building that in and and, and trusting that an actor is going to going to pull it off and have fun pulling it off. You know? Right. I mean, Mr. Blonde's a perfect example of that. Like you have yeah. no idea where Mr. Blonde's going. Uh, and yeah, it's a great, a great, great analogy. Well, I mean, look, I, I, I love Tarantino, but I think Tarantino uh, – I don't necessarily always get the sense and I'm not shitting on him in any way, but I Mm -hmm. think his sort of type of movies and it feels like in a way only he can do it. There's no no question. He's the only, what what other director is going to direct Inglorious Bastards? Like, no, I know. And that, I mean, that's one of my favorite movies, but I don't necessarily get that these, his movies have like a theme in the, along the way of like where my work is and where I come from. I don't know if that's dictating him. Although Mm -hmm. I feel deep resonance and I love his movies and watch them over and over again because I love the characters and the camera work and I get emotionally involved. But whereas if I see like a Scorsese movie or some other newer directors that I love, like I really, you know, man, it's, it's so funny. I, I, I never watched little women, the Greta Gerwig movie. And my daughter was like, you gotta see, you gotta see it. And I saw it and I was fucking blown away. I was like, I couldn't believe how much I love that movie. I mean, I've watched it multiple times and Mm -hmm. you know, you just never know. So, but I watched her movie and I'm like, oh, she, there's clear what she's having to say with this and it's all cohesive and it, and it all works. And, and again, not that he doesn't do that, but you know, I can, I can clearly see a Scorsese movie and say that there's a, like a dark thematic idea he's working out of it. Um, but right. you know, whatever it is, it's all different. I just think if, if someone, I don't know who else, but Tarantino can engage me to that degree without having some sort of more, you know, commentary on, on the human condition, but, but he does. Uh, but it, I mean, and he's also just on a whole other level, his own level. Uh, right. And there's just nobody else that, that, that works the way he does. Like I was yeah. like, the, like you were saying like, okay, let's give Nolan inglorious bastards. Let's give Fincher Django Unchained. Like that's, I, I mean, I'd be interested to see those films by the way. Yeah. I would, surely would be, but they're not, he writes so perfectly for well, himself. And I think- I think to your point, I think Tarantino's directing starts when he writes and it's all fluid. So it's not someone taking a a script, which, which, by the way, I mean, I love that process as a playwright. That's the bread and butter of what playwriting is, is you create something and then you the the chemical reaction of having a director have their interpretation of that text. That's the beauty of it, whereas Tarantino, it's like from start to end, it's it's his sort of singular vision which is really cool i mean it's amazing and, and ver- I, I see everything he does opening night and and very few and very few artists can do it at that level within a studio system <laughs> like there's not there's just that there's just not many that list is very very short um now when you're writing uh either plays or scripts do you start with character or plot um i mean or theme yeah, no, it depends. I mean, I, to me, look, honestly, it's different in each situation. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just different in each situation. I think usually, you know, did you read that book uh, on writing by Stephen King? Yeah, yeah, such a great, oh, such yeah, a great so great. But I think what he said, I think he said it. It's been a while that clicked so much as he's like, look, you have this little bubble here, a great idea of a character, or a sketch, or a scene, and you have this little bubble here. It might be a theme. It might be this and that. And they're kind of all floating around. And then suddenly they click, and you're like, "Holy shit, that's what it is." So to me, it's always been at least two pieces clicking. <laughs> you know, like for Small Engine Repair, it was this idea of the themes being a father, all that messiness kind of floating there, and then the composites of the character here. It's all like kind of ragged, and then suddenly they click, and they just stick together, and you're like, okay, that's it. Now we're off. Um, you know, but uh, all I try to say and try to do is like, if I'm going to sit there and write about it, it has to be compelling to me to make it work, uh, right. to put the time and to really make my work 
shine, I have to be compelled by it. I have to be moved deeply by something in it in order to do it. So that's, uh, you know, that's part of that, of that whole process. But yeah, sometimes it's, yeah, I think it is like a real interesting character. I mean, certainly with the case of Stronger, the book was not a great, I don't think it was, it was not a deep book. It was, he wrote it really quick. It was like an airport book. And in reading that, I was like compelled by what wasn't said as much as what was said. And, right. and knowing the truth of the neighborhoods and talking to him a little bit, I was like, oh, the story here is like the subtext of that whole book is what I made that movie about, which is he feels pressured to be this hero. And we are so much more comfortable when he is and that struggle that the book is like, hey, rah, rah, everything's good. But then meeting him, you're like, things aren't good. He's really struggling. Let's peel that back. So, you know, that was a case of that, like an investigative thing. But, you know, it's different in, in every in every situation. But now, uh, now, a lot of screenwriters listening uh, dream of being having one of their scripts on the blacklist. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to go down that journey? Because you talk, you we kind of skimmed over it a little bit, but like you, you know, I think it was number two on the blacklist that year or something like that. What yeah. is, what is, how does the town treat you? What was that whole kind of world? in? because at that, at that point you're the bell of the ball and so many people are calling. I mean, you know, look, I, I, when I found out I was in the office with Alex and Todd and, and Jake Gyllenhaal and we had Scott Silver on the phone and we were all talking. So kind of things were already in motion at that sure. point. And I think for, maybe, for that project, for that project. Yeah. Just, so it was like, I mean, look, I had an early agent, this guy, uh, Ron Guiazda at Abrams, and he was primarily my theater agent, but he was great. And one thing he said to me, a word of advice, which I, I, I think is unbelievably difficult to follow, but super healthy. He's like, just be pleasantly surprised when things work out. That's just conduct yourself <laughs> like you know what I mean? That's great advice. So when actually. I found out, I was pleasantly surprised. But look, it didn't change your life. It didn't make things easier. It definitely – look, I think all of these sort of accolades and stuff, they make things a little easier to do what you want to do. But at the end of the day, you're still looking at a blank page. You still want to create something that you're like – you're proud of and you want to do. And, and those things are nice. I'm always like cautious because – if you believe the hype, you also have to believe it when people don't get it. And it's it's a very tricky thing. And, you know, I've been doing it long enough to know that things that are trendy or whatever don't that they don't necessarily like you have to believe in a more absolute purpose, I think, of, of what is it? What is your artistic journey? And, you know, I always go back to punk rock. You look at punk rock back then and you're like, you know, the shit that you look at and you're like, God damn, that is like the real deal. Um, didn't know to have those pats on the backs then, you know what I mean? Like they just didn't, I mean, well, I always find it funny as I, as I started to come and get more serious about film that I would think about like my favorite movies, my favorite plays. And then you go back and you look and a lot of them got destroyed in either reviews or box office. I mean, look at Shawshank Redemption. It's destroyed. No yeah. even knew about it. I well, mean, be, that's be, maybe a lot of people's top 10 list to this day. And, but to be fair, the, it's a horrible title. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the worst titles of all time, but what one of the best. I, I I don't even know. I don't. What what? No, Stephen King called it. What was it? What was the uh, his title was Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption was the name of his like novella that it was based yeah. on. Yeah, I don't know what I'd call it either. I mean, it's it's a tough thing, but it's like how do you how do you mark because uh, how do you market that film? Like I don't even know. It's so hard to market it, but arguably one of the worst titles. Well, ever. and that's the other thing is like you know the some of the hardest things to market. And best. I certainly experienced that a lot with our movie is like, it's tricky. Some things that are super easy to market are not necessarily good. Some things are harder. I mean, that's just the nature of it. And then it comes up and it's there. I mean, you know, well, I think so, this is why, you know, the, the movies that stand the test of time, they just find their own path, but it doesn't always happen, you know, immediately. No, I always love, I always like seeing that picture of George Lucas with a t-shirt that had a bad review of Star Wars on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he just walk around on set with this bad review of Star Wars. Some, I think, some guy in Variety or something just ripped Star Wars apart in seventy seven. I mean, look, <laughs> you know, I've uh, it, it's it's a very complicated thing. The the review system. I mean, look, I mm. think reviews <clears throat> reviews exist. Uh, I've certainly got some incredible reviews. I've gotten some bad reviews. I've I've learned from reviews. I've also had uh, been like deeply emotionally affected by them, and that's obviously on me. I mean, I think the purpose of reviews is simply like, hey, this is one person's opinion. 
let me see. And by the way, I have reviewers in the theater world that I will read the reviews. And if they love something, I'll be like, I'm not going to love it because I know this person's aesthetic. Conversely, if they like shit all over it, I'm like, you know what? There's something going on here. But, you know, that's the purpose of it. And, you know, God love people who dedicate their lives to the arts in any way, shape or form. But it's just difficult when you've worked so hard on something to have people. Uh, the hardest thing for me is always like if they don't get it. You don't have to like something, but if they don't get it. You know, I had plays written where I had reviews who were like they literally didn't get certain plot twists that or or machinations to the plot that they didn't get and which led to confusion or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. You know, like it's there. So those things bother me worse. But, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, I don't think I'd ever get a T-shirt and wear it. I mean, maybe if I made uh, Star Wars, I would. But, I uh, mean, there, well, again, another another person on a very short list. <laughs> True enough. And then, <laughs> my God, did he take a drubbing with those uh, those prequels that he did? I mean, that had. He still, you know, but the funny thing about the prequels is, I agree. I, I don't. I don't particularly like them. I enjoyed them when I came out, but I was younger, and then I came back and I watched. I watched Phantom Menace with my daughter the other day. I'm like, oh my God! Other than the action sequence with Darth Maul, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's just not well. I didn't like the way it was written. Forgive me, George. But there's a generation. That yeah. that's their Star Wars films. No, they love it. I mean, they like people, it. the memes are all over the place. They defend <laughs> it to the end. And, and <laughs> you know, look, man, look, there's a there's a, con, you know, there's a form of art where I, I don't necessarily subscribe to it. But like, you know, you look at a, a painting of a stop sign and people will stare at it for four hours and it has deep resonance. And it's that's great. So sometimes the creativity is in is in the reception of it as well as it is in the actual thing. But uh, I, I just don't think those, the prequels were not my favorite Star Wars. And, and I'm not going to change my mind on that. Uh, well, we're, I mean, we're, we're of, of, of similar vintage, sir. So uh, I think we both grew up with the same <laughs> Star yeah, Wars exactly. films. <laughs> oh my God, so excited. I saw that at the Ziegfeld Theater. I mean, I was so excited to see that. I was like, but I, and so that was before the internet really was was going on. Like, so you read a review in the paper and the paper was like, nah, I don't know about this. And I was like, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. And then you saw it and you're just like, oh, OK, this maybe wasn't worth the wait, but whatever. But it, like you said, it stood the test of time. People. But I have watching. to ask you, I have to ask you, since, you know, you enjoy Star Wars, um, The Mandalorian. I mean, yeah, that's cool, man. That is some they are just they're hitting it all cylinders, man. That's well, you know, it took me a couple episodes to sort of figure out what it is. And then yeah. I was like, oh, it's cool. It's kind of like an old 70s spaghetti Western, like Kung Fu type thing. And then I was super I found it super enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, re I really do. I really dig it. Yeah. Now let's talk about small engine repair, which, uh, you know, tell me how, 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 what is it about and how did it, how did it even come to be? So small engine repair started its life as a, a late night play at, uh, a theater company that I was a co-founder at in, um, Los Angeles. And we, my wife was a producer of the late night series at that time. And what it was is you'd have a main stage play. And we had a big like 100 seat theater and then like a 50 seat theater. So in the 50 seat theater, they were doing Sunset Limited with uh, Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> so to your previous point of how does ideas germinate? So I sat and I watched that play. It was great. It was getting tons of people in there. And the late night plays, you just when they walk off, you got to go on. But you need to have a set that can easily uh, function with their set. You need to not reinvent their sort of lighting scheme. Um, you gotta make it simple, you know what I mean? Right, and right. you have a lower budget and, and you, you know, everybody leaves and then you do it. So what that does give you creative license is to write whatever the hell you want and to not worry about the pressures of being like a commercial mainstream play, um, which theater, especially at that time was always like the more provocative it was. So we were doing like plays or readings of like Adam Rapp, Sarah Kane, Neil LeBute, like really cool, edgy provocative stuff. So I was looking at the set and I had that like idea of these characters and sort of the what if scenario for myself was always like, okay, what if I didn't go to college? What if I stayed and went, you know, became more of the kind of archetypes of some people I knew growing up, you know, in particular, there was like a guy, I had a Harley and there was a guy who ran a um, shop at the end of the street on South Willow. And I used to go there and hang out while he'd do it. And I was just like, oh, that guy's cool. It's like a single set. This guy holds court. He's got his pit bull on the thing and he's got the friends keep coming and going. Hey, you want a beer? And just doing that. And I was like, oh, this is a cool set. So then I looked at the Corrent McCarthy set and I was like, okay, you could turn this into a shop. And 
you know, the whole lawnmower kind of thing seemed interesting to me. And then I just started to populate it. And then it was like thematically what was going on, having a daughter, you know, in sort of the environment like you grew up with, too, where Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what it's like to be like in the tough guy circuit posturing or whatever (laughs) and how you gain status from talking in a certain way. But like how coded that is. But like, I just knew that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I've always had a knack for dialogue and especially that sort of the rhythms of that sort of neighborhood, working class neighborhood. I'm like, I got that. And then, well, how do I incorporate what's personal to me, which is like having a foot in both of those worlds? Being, I consider myself a feminist and having a daughter and, and feeling so deeply oh, the, the, the visceral emotion of that with also knowing I could walk into, you know, the locker room or anything and I could trade barbs with anybody and talk shit with anybody. And a lot of times it's about women and it's misogynistic sort of Mm -hmm. the world. So I put those two together and sort of saw how the chemicals would go off. And then it was also like, look, this, the, the, the sort of tool set that you have on a play. And again, put up the set, lights come up, do your play, lights go down, like the simpler, the easier it is. So that I knew I was like, I'm going to do a master scene. And I had written other plays that sort of toyed with that formula. I had written a play where the whole second act is one scene. And I just really liked that idea of just, you know, drawing the tension out in a one act continuous thing, felt it would be very immersive. So that kind of all informed this sort of idea of getting these guys, the, the structure of what it would be, you know, was sort of slowly chipping away at an audience's resolve and starting to feel like they're the guys and starting to see through that, you know, the triggering words and start just feeling like you're in a garage and then have that stuff happen. But, and, and to be, you know, the, the prerequisite of late night is like, you have to provoke, you have to like feel something. You don't want to go and sit and watch a play that just reinforces everything you already believe. Like let's emerge from this unsettled or provoked. And have a roller coaster because it's 1030. People been drinking, you know, you want to engage. And so all of that stuff was in it. And that sort of birthed the play, which we did very low stakes late night. And it just kind of caught fire. And then it went to main stage and it kept moving. You know, John Bernthal, who was a part of that, it was always like, hey, we're really on to something. Sometimes you just have something that in particular, this material. Look, we had uh, uh, theater lovers there who had seen every play in L.A. for the past, you know, 20 years loving it. We had like, you know, Bernthal has a bunch of friends, fighters and cops who would sit there, never been to a play and they loved it. So we created this community of, of, you know, gay, straight, you know, working man, you know, working class artists, everything. And it was just great because everyone was in it and got it, you know, got what the piece was trying to say there. The, the, the play is in, in nor the movie is written. It's not pandering. It's really like keep up with us. And you have to use your head to really understand what this is about at the end of the day. It's like hidden. No one's saying the theme, you know, the theme that I was working with. No one sits down and says, wow, this is the lesson I learned. It's not that, you know, uh, and, and, and people were getting it and loving it and it kept moving. So John and I were always like, hey, this would be a good movie. Also, as you know, in the independent film world, the more contained your story is, the better it is to keep it at a certain budget. And it was like, well, shit, that's all it is. And I had to open it up, obviously, to make it a movie. But I tried to be really strategic about that thematic, making sure that it's cohesive. But still, the majority of the movie, you know, of the four weeks we shot, three weeks were in the shop. Right. And that's where the majority of the activity happens. And that that kept it, you know, doable. It made it so that we could make the movie for that. So... All of the, the the play really informed the movie and that's sort of how it happened. And John and I, our relationship and where our careers went and finally having the time and him certainly having the ability to get people really excited to put money into it and, and you know, make it happen. And, and then, you know, it just kind of clicked. We, we really got lucky until we got incredibly unlucky with the pandemic. <laughs> hey, you're not the only one who's been hit by that, sir, in the, in the film no, industry. Just, <laughs> people are suffering a lot worse, but I'm just like – and by the way, we were like – the pandemic hit and then vertical films bought the film and they're so excited about doing this big theatrical lease. And we're like, awesome people's masks are off. And then now we're back with the Delta. Look, to to what we were saying about before, 
hey, we made a movie. It's a miracle. You put it out. I believe that this movie will find an audience. It just might take a longer. And like I think about myself as like I saw Reservoir Dogs. I didn't see it in the movie theater. I caught it on VHS afterwards. And it's like, oh, you know, how enjoyable that is and how many times I watch it. So, I mean, I'm hoping for something like that uh, just because, I mean, I don't know. None of us know when the uh, when the movies are going to come back to normal. Oh, man, I don't know either. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I was able to watch one movie in that window where everything yeah. was good. And you're like, oh, everyone's vaxxed. Everyone could go in. And I watched the movie. I was just like. I had forgotten. It's been a year since I'd been into a movie theater. I was like, oh man, this is so much fun. It was oh, it's a the packed house. It was everything. And then. Wah, wah, wah. I know. Look, I, look, man, I'll wear a mask. I'll go to a movie. I'll do yeah. it. You know, I'll, uh, I'll go see small and in the theater with an audience, which is like, you know, that's the hardest thing is like this material is, Oh, I've been able to battle test it over and over again with a, with an audience. Yeah. 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 I'm like, I you know, man, it's like it didn't really happen to me until I can have that. So, and and by the way, John, uh, for my for my money, one of the best actors working today of his oh, generation. Yeah. Uh, he's absolutely remarkable. I mean, uh, and I can list off a thousand things that he's done, but uh, I just love his. Uh, I think that's. I think one of the things I like about both your performance and his in the film is the um, the rawness. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a there's a there's a thing about. When you have a masculine, like, you know, that, in that term, toxic masculinity, but, but, you know, in the performances, to be a tough guy, but a vulnerable tough guy is not right. easy. And, and to pull off both is not easy within, within a character and within a performance. And that's what. No, I mean, that, that's him. And I mean, look, I had the advantage of knowing him and he's one of my closest friends and really shaping the character in a way that I felt accessed his tool set as an actor in a way. You know, he's played a variety of these characters, but I was like, you can, <clears throat> he can get away with murder. So you could craft a, his character to be like, his Sueno is like really a, a, a study in contradictions and so many things that you say. But beneath it all, John is a human being, but as a performer has a huge heart. And he's tough as hell and he's got all that stuff. But also he was fearless in, in creating this version that sort of subverted a lot of his persona and, and, and being, you know, kind of very vulnerable and very sort of submissive in a way that he certainly isn't as a real person, but he has the capacity to do that. I mean, look, that's ultimately – And again, I never want to tell people what the movie is about. I want people to always, you know, come to their own conclusions. But it's certainly a study in, um, I wouldn't even necessarily say toxic masculinity. I would say modern masculinity. But in particular, you know, the struggle that we have, like you can say, coming from a neighborhood where you have your masculine and your feminine. And and, and they're, you know, and and how do those two coexist? And really the movie is looking at the places where they, they bounce up against each other. There's places like I wanted to create you know, these guys who you wouldn't ordinarily see being so intimate with each other and loving with each other, but then the violence and the undercurrents and just kind of created in a very raw, real way. Now, I love John is one of my favorite actors as well. And, and, but he's like a real guy. Like he doesn't have to act or research what that guy is. He has those tool set within him and it's just effortless. So then you can go a whole other level and start deconstructing it. And, and I don't know if it's, if it's the same case in, in where you came up, where you came up from, but when I came up in my culture, you know, women, you know, very much East, I mean, Latinos are very much East, uh, and, you know, and my God, my, my father was one of the, I think the first generation that didn't cheat, uh, mm-hmm. on his, on his mom. My grandfather had like, you know, I don't know how many kids and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But the women in, in the side of our, of my family and of, of all my family throughout my family, uh, close and far are very strong women. Like you didn't disrespect a woman in the no. family. You might disrespect, you might say some shit about somebody else and you might say something wrong about the girl around the corner, but you would mm-hmm. never disrespect. And so I think that for me, at least always really, uh, guided my path in regards to how I treat women in general because of that just like you don't do that you were raised not to do that I was raised by women basically so I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm surrounded by women now <laughs> yeah no I, listen I think you and I are similar in that sense and I think that was a saving grace for me is like you know I have uh, my sisters and, and how influential they were to me in not having that you know it's funny man later in life I started to have friends and stuff who had trouble with women and I was like oh wait you don't have a sister you know what I mean like <laughs> I've, I've shared my deepest secrets with a, with my sisters my whole life. So it was, it was very easy to have that 
that relationship. But, you know, and, and again, to back to back up a little bit, the play was all men. It was the three guys and then the and then the college guy who shows up and all of the women in the movie were referred to, but they weren't ever seen. So the movie did give a great opportunity in terms of obviously the power of cinema to 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 punch in on someone's face like Sierra who's the heart of the movie and mm-hmm. the heart of the play her character even though she's not on stage it it just amplifies all of those emotions that you and I are talking about where it it just further complicates it and it's not you know it, it's not like a a simple cinematic cheat it's like you they're flesh and blood characters and and they're involved in the in the movie thematically and and, and plot wise uh, you know the movie doesn't exist without them it's not you know just lip service now i have to ask you the question man sure uh this is your first film <laughs> <laughs> so you're directing you wrote it and you're acting in it are you nuts <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's a tough, yeah. it's, it's tough actually, to do one of those things, brother, instead of you did all three. <laughs> well, look, I mean, here's the truth is yeah. it's hard to take a chunk of time out of your life to pursue a passion project. Mm-hmm. So to some extent, I was like, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to be all in. Now, I knew I was going to write and direct it. I had played that character for so long with so many different directors with, you know, Andrew Block, with Joe Bonney in New York. And it just I just understood it inside and out. And I felt this is a very unique once in a lifetime opportunity to play a character whose emotional state mirrors that of a first time director, which is terror, stress, trying to keep all that (laughs) anger in at any given moment that I'm on camera. But the character is just manipulating it subtly. The whole fucking movie. He's just pushing it slowly. He's the least flashy of all the things, but he's just sitting there and he has a check and he's making sure all the chess pieces click. And that's what, uh, it just clicked like that, you know? And I mean, I couldn't have done it without John and Shay. Mm -hmm. Um, and the key in this particular thing was, I mean, look, it's one of those things they say you, when you're naive, you, you don't realize the challenges ahead, but it was, it was very much in having, you know, very, very seasoned producers who had my back, um, you, you know, Rick Rosenthal, who's a very seasoned director, Peter Abrams done a bunch of movies, Noah, um, who was, uh, uh, my manager, but he also did that. Everyone had my back and in the DP and I, Matt Mitchell laying out every single shot. So there were no surprises. We all knew everything ahead of time and it was all there. And look, in theory, I feel if you do your pre-production really, really well on the day, you can kind of almost just sit back and let everything click into place. It was all pre-production. It was table work. It was knowing every little thing so that in the moment when we had those discoveries – and look, you know how this goes too. We didn't have a budget that after every take, we could, like Frank Darabont did, you know, pause it, do a playback, look at it, make sure, okay, move the briefcase a little bit that way, move that. You just didn't have that time. So you yeah. trust your DP that it's going to look good. And then like instead of doing that, let's just roll again. These are, these are you know, the best actors that you could get. You know, so then create a system around it where they can really do their thing. And that's it was all around that apparatus. So, I mean, look, I, I and, and, and and again, the, the script was my direction. For like, here's what it is. And look, we improvised. We found a lot of new stuff, but we kept going back to that that roadmap and, and all those things and discovering stuff. So it, it, as terrifying as it was, I knew I had done so much prep. Right. That it just sort of had a life of its own and it kind of, you know, it was just happening before my eyes. And you can feel it when you're there. Mm-hmm. This is the th- muscles you learn in theater. When you're on stage with someone and something is happening, you can't deny that. The air changes. So I just kind of looked for that. And if it felt that way in the moment, even if I'm on camera or whatever, then I'm like, okay, we have captured something. Is this story beat or whatever? Let's just keep going. And then look, the edit was – an embarrassment of riches. We had the performances when there was nothing, you never had to like edit around a performance. It was like, it was all there. Oh, there I, so I, many gifts given. Oh no. I've had the, I've had the pleasure of directing uh, newbie actors and Oscar yeah. winning actors. And in between the two, man, I take the, the, the seasoned actors every day because it's, it, they make your life so easy. A good actor. Oh, yeah. It just like, you don't even as a director, it just makes you look good as a director when you have, that kind of talent in front of the lens and you're not 
forcing and pulling and tugging a performance. Well, out. look, I think I think uh, just some great advice I got early on, which is like hire the best and then get out of the way. And yeah. I think that that's accurate for you know I'm here to support and I would talk. And you have character, you have actors like Shea Wiggum who's brilliant, and you know we sat at the table for months really answering questions and, and working through it. And then you had, you know, actors like uh, Sierra, who I met a couple of times. We worked a lot, talked, and then she showed up and she had all her work done. And it was just little adjustments. But I'm not a control freak. I like want to create, um, which again, I, I, I learned a lot working with David Gordon Green and sort of shadowing him on Stronger. It's like he sets the table and then he lets you go. And it's like it's it's invigorating making a movie with him. And I wanted to create that. I mean, we worked our asses off, but everyone was empowered. It's like every single person contributed to that project, everyone who was there. And, and, and it was just sort of a communal art project, you know? Now there's, uh, you know, when, when someone's on a, when a director's on a project, there's always that one day, at least for me, I'm not sure if it's for you, but that day that everything feels like it's falling apart, that I'm like, oh my yeah. God, this, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it over this day or something happened. What was the toughest day in the production <clears throat> for you? And what did you um, learn? And what did you learn from it? Well, great, great question. So I would say there were a couple of dark moments, <laughs> maybe dark. three or four, yeah. that you're just like the hole opens up on the floor and you're like, holy shit. And I mean, what it taught me was just take a deep breath and right. you'll get through. So I'll tell you uh, one example that ended out being a gift. And then I'll tell you one example, which was a massive challenge, and we had to make it work. So the gift was the opening scene of the movie. You saw the movie, I'm assuming. I have not. I have not yet. I didn't get a chance to see it yet. I'm dying no to see it. I'm dying to see it. No worries. You'll uh, I, you'll follow up. Let me know what you think afterwards. Yeah, so yeah. the opening scene, um, as it was constructed, was the sort of no dialogue version that we cut out. So it sort of takes place slightly in the past. So most of the movie takes place in the shop. So we dressed the shop to be like it's for sale. It's like the first day at the shop. Um, Frank, the character I play, comes back. Uh, he's served a couple of days in prison for fighting. You know, his daughters. He hasn't seen his daughter in a little bit. He hasn't seen his friends. He shows up in the front. He's kind of cut up. He's got a cast. It's like telling all the story, like no dialogue. And we had the dolly shot and we had to move it in the cinematic and move it around. And it was a very one of the three or four just really complicated cinematic shots that wasn't necessarily about the acting. It was about the shot, the fluidity, like maybe the credits come in and right. all that stuff. It was like really like storyboarded, mapped out, which we did on like two things. And, um, you know, we had the dolly tracks. We had the extra crew. We had all that stuff. And again, the art department dressed the outside of the shop on that day. So like we can't shoot anything else until that stuff is stripped. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, John Bernthal and, and Shea Wiggum show up and the the, the younger, ver the four-year-old version of the Crystal character who Sierra plays is played by John's daughter, Addie, who I know, but, you know, I know her pretty well. I know I've known her through the years, but she's there with her dad and they're supposed to come up put her down. She runs up to my character. We hug, look at everybody. And we're like, we're going to do it. It's like setting up the story. So it's supposed to snow, but not till about one o'clock. So they shot my coverage with the dolly or whatever coming out of the truck and doing all that stuff. And then they turn it around and it starts to snow and it's like early, but you're like, okay, can we make it work? Dude, it started to snow as strong as you could imagine to the point that you can't go in a dolly. They're covered. You can't keep sweeping it. So we lost the dolly. And then the equipment started to get affected. And you're like, holy shit, what are we going to do? And then we did one reverse take with, with Addie. And she's freezing. And what she comes you? to me because she knows me. But she's like, I don't want to go to this asshole. I want to go with my dad. I'm cold. She's four. And you're like, Jesus. So that was a dark moment because what are you going to do? So then in the moment, you know, we, the producers gather around. What footage do we have? What do we need to retake? And John was like, we're working on it. And, and it became like, what? moment or we have like don't invent it don't deny it let's see what happens so we had maybe two more takes as the snow was gathering and before the equipment was damaged she comes up you know my character frank reaches out for her and she doesn't want to go to me she's like i want to stay with my dad i don't want to do it so i get her and it's heartbreaking she's crying she goes back to that and then i'm like just being emotive about like i'm feeling we're all feeling the stress and the tension of it and then at the end of the day it's like you know, hey, stay with him. It's okay, honey. And we did it. So we shot, you know, without our sort of choreograph, we shot a whole bunch of angles and we did it and we had it in the can. And I was like, all right, either we're just going to start later. 
and I, I, when we were in the house, I shot some pickup stuff, but so we had all that footage and like, what is it? It's not going to be what I thought it was. It's not what it was in the script, but it ended up being a gift because now we created the sequence that opens it where my character gets out of jail. He sees his daughter, he reaches out for her and she hasn't seen him in a little bit. So she's like, who is this guy? She's upset. And she goes to, to John, who's the, you know, the, the surrogate uncle and the other one and, and, it, and into Shay. And then my character's just distraught by it. And then we go into the shop and we used like 90% of the footage that we shot. The editors put together a beautiful, heartbreaking sequence. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Mm-hmm. That was darker and and less fun, but it was so much more deeply resonant thematically that it informed the whole movie. And it 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 it, it made the movie darker and more beautiful and tougher mm-hmm. and way harder. And like I said, that was a gift because all of everything feeling on that and the in in Addie feeling she's only four, she doesn't know what's going on. All of that tension right on the screen. It's on screen. And and when you think about that, when you see it and, and how, again, that was, uh, you know, it was tough to find every little, make sure we had coverage and everything. And we had to digitally add snow on like one shot or whatever to make it all match. But it's like, I'm like, I can't believe we had that gift, you know? Right. So that was the, that was the gift. What was the, oh my God. Well, the, the, the hardest day without a doubt was the day we shot at a big bar fight and the, our, our fight choreographers were. Uh, the coordinator was uh, Eric Linden, uh, who did the Punisher, all the fights. Oh. The Mar- He's a big oh. Marvel guy. Like, he's doubles as Captain America and shit. Like, he is the man. And obviously, he knows John. And, you know, John's that kind of guy that everything he works on, people are like, I'll do anything you work for because he is that guy. He's so real and amazing. I mean, that's how I, you know, got to know him. So, shared the script with Eric and was like, hey, you're going to do this. But uh, he was like, hell yeah. And, you know, a lot of the Marvel choreography, which is super fun to watch, it's like it, – it, it, it's not porn, but it's like pause the story. Let's do this kick-ass exciting fight sequence. Sometimes it moves the plot. Sometimes it doesn't. It's thrilling and it's its own specific thing. This was like the fights and the violence have to fit thematically and in the tone and in the world of it. And he was really eager about that challenge. But we had a lot to shoot in that bar. And <laughs> – then this fight and it was chaotic and you know the dp hadn't really shot a fight scene to that extent and then we ended up having to reinvent a lot of stuff and it was you know but the guys we were beating up i mean you have john who's an expert at that i mean i'd done some of that stuff but not to that extent shay was really comfortable with it but the 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 stuntmen we had were like you know just hit me like pretty much just like just really do it they're all padded up so we just beat the shit out of each other quite a bit and it was like shooting from this angle from this angle and it was the terror of i don't know like unlike Mm -hmm. other things you have to get enough coverage on those physical things otherwise they're just not going to cut right right so it was chaotic we shot which I, i think eric linden was like all right here's the solution let's shoot one master tracking that's all the right angles and and then once you have that and it took a lot. We're eating time getting that one. But once you have that, you can always cut back and forth to it. So this was all like new information and like my plan and with the DP, like all that stuff. It was like, what are you going to do? Like you can't – this is the only day we have on this set. Right. And so we just shot it and, and you know, I was terrified the whole time and having to be <laughs> physical and doing all that stuff. Right. And then, I mean the fight is incredible on – I mean like I'm blown away about how good it looks because it has – all that shit. But on that day, I mean, I was like, why did I make this movie? <laughs> like, what, what, what am I what, doing? What, what, why am I here? I, I was, I, why was, am I, I, here? <laughs> I literally, I, I literally was like, there's a hole opened up behind me and I'm like sinking in it. Like, what am I doing? I'm sweating in the back of the, yeah. I was like, this is a disaster. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that was the, that was the most sort of terrifying moment of me just because it was all of the things clicking together. You had all the extras, you had all this stuff. And then, I forgot what happened. Like the, there was a big bus of extras that weren't there on time or something. Oh, I mean, there was just like yeah. all the problems happening at once. Anyway, no, that and, the, that no, that's in, in Martin, Martin Scorsese says it very best. He goes, if you look at your film and you don't think it's an absolute disaster, you're not doing something right. Like uh, I mean, there, there's always a moment. There's always a moment that you're just like, this is a fiasco. I'll never work in this. I'll never work again. 
this is the last time you get you get you get that you get that feeling i had a fight sequence fight sequences are i mean unless you're michael bay yeah <laughs> or or well, tony scott cameras and money to shoot over three know, yeah, 400 days. cameras and a giant transforming robot that's a whole other conversation yeah but uh no i was shooting a fight sequence one day and i had the greatest stunt team and from kill bill and the matrix and uh, you know this insane stunt coordinator from 24 and they they've been working on this fight sequence and i just but the team I had, I couldn't uh, catch up on the day. On the, on the, I was just, I wasn't getting my pages. So when yeah. we finally got to the fight sequence, they had wire work set up. They had wire work set up. They had rigging set up. And they're like, I'm like, we got to rework this, man. We got to, sorry, we can't, we don't have time for the rigging. So, and they re, they reworked the entire fight sequence just from like, we got two hours. What can we do in two oh, hours? Yeah. And so we did, just, you, did you lose your mind or do you just take a deep breath or do you have an out no, I No, that whole shoot, that whole shoot, I lost my mind because there, the, 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 the weirdness about that film was that I had some amazing talent, probably some of the best talent I ever worked with. Um, and it was like the first thing I'd done in Hollywood really with like some amazing technicians, um, some really accomplished actors. And then the support team was not accomplished. Yeah. So, and that was the thing. So the support team did not stay up at the same level as the rest of them. So the head was great, but the rest of the team wasn't. I mean, isn't it wrong. remarkable how it's like, you know, it's that analogy. They say it's like a, it's like a stereo equipment. Your, your stereo is only as good as its weakest component. And oh. you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I feel beyond blessed at everybody I had, but yeah. you're like, in, in retrospect, you're like, wow, with that one oh. piece, oh. you're screwed. I I like you have Meryl Streep there, but if your AD sucks, like you're screwed. I did a whole movie where my audio guy saved me. My location audio guy. So he was like, it was completely on location all the time. Actors running around uh, in in public. We were doing kind of like this, you know, like just running around and cap, you know, capturing stuff. And everyone's like, I don't know how the sound's going to be. I'm like, I hear, I hear it's fine. And I got into post. My my post sound guy's like, who the hell was your location sound guy? Like you oh, were in the wow. snow, yeah. you were in the snow, you had 50,000 people running around and all this stuff. And it sounds crystal clear, man. And meanwhile, on the day, everyone's furious at the sound guy because he's like, wait, do all this. Like they're the <laughs> asshole. <laughs> always, <song>. always. <laughs> and we had an incredible sound team as well, just like you. But so often people like would be like, oh, well, what, waiting on, on waiting right. on sound. Wait, plane, like, fuck it. You can't make it. You know what I mean? And it's like waiting yes. on sound. And always. You're, posting, you're like, dear God, you see. Thank, thank God he did what he did because it just it, without it, there's no movie. So it's yeah. it's it's fascinating, man. Um, now, I have to ask you, uh, you're working on the new uh, Hulk Hogan movie, right? Yes. With uh, with Todd Phillips. Is there, and Scott uh, Silver's. Right. right. Is there anything you can say about it? Because I'm a huge Hulk fan and I can't wait to see it. I, I definitely can't say stuff on the air. I'm like terrified to. I've never I've never worked on anything that was so under lock and key. I'd well, be happy then how's it? Off, how's it how, off, off, off camera. All right. Sorry, guys. Off off air. But um, but how is it working with Todd? And, and he's Todd? great. Yeah. You know, I had met him, you know, as like a general meeting years ago. And I was like, oh, my God, like we talked, we talked for like an hour and then his next meeting didn't show up. We just hung out twice. <laughs> and I was just like, he's such a cool guy. Like he's so easy to talk to, very disarming, um, just like a cool dude. Like, I mean, you'd love that guy. Oh. <laughs> and then, you know, working with him on this. Now, Ta Scott had made uh, the Joker with him, Joker oh. movie with him, Not which is movie. incredible, obviously. <laughs> so you can see the kind of people I get to work with, which is so awesome. Yeah. So those guys are obviously have a great, you know, shorthand of working relationship. So when, when I'm in the room with the two of them, first of all, it's funny watching them bust each other's balls. But like, <laughs> you know, because uh, Scott and I have a certain dynamic. And then when Todd comes in, it's like all different. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, he's he's great, man. He's a fearless. He's like an artist. He's like got really, really smart notes. And, you know, Scott's super smart. It's, it's just it's uh, you know, this is what I always wanted was to work with people who like really lift you up in your game and, and help you do things, you know, bring out the best in you. And, uh, you know, I can't speak highly enough about those two guys. And, and you know, I'm really excited to make that movie. And I think it's going to yeah. be awesome. And, and Chris, it's, it, Chris it's, that's the one with Chris, right? Chris yeah, with, I've yeah. never really hung out with him. I only hear yeah. through, through the through the grapevine of every you know everybody else. But I'm a huge fan of Chris Hemsworth. I mean, he's like just having him in my head as you write Hulk Hogan dialogue is just yeah. really fun. I cannot. I'm because I'm a huge Hulk. I mean, I was a wrestling fan and all that you, stuff. This whole you will love the movie. I can't wait. I cannot wait. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask all my guests. 
Sure. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, well, I, I, I think, wow, that's a deep question. I think the thing that lo- that took me the longest to learn was to, because of the way I was raised and where I came from, I think it was having enough confidence to say and do what I wanted and to not look to outward permission to do what I wanted to do. And as, as an artist, primarily, I mean, I've, I, 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 like you were talking about is like, I'm really blessed that I've had some really caring people in my life, whether it was the teacher when you needed it. And I mean, quite profoundly was when I met my wife in that acting class and I, she's such an incredible actress. She's actually in the movie and she was just like sitting down with her and having her break down my early plays and doing it. It was like, dude, you should do this. Like, you're really good at this. It was like, I am, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then having that at that moment in my life, you know, when, when, you're, you don't. And then, like I said, my biggest regret was always not figuring out earlier to be like, this is, this, this is what I want to do. And I don't care if you get it or not. I get it. You know what I mean? And then, uh, and then do it and, and being comfortable with being vulnerable like that. And look, it's still not completely easy. I'm putting out this movie. It's the first thing I made. It's, it's, it's latching into all of those things I've worked so hard to get past and you just got to be healthy about it. But you have to find that, that strength to just, you know, be confident enough in who you are. Very cool. It and time. It's still a work in progress. <laughs> we, we are all a work in progress here. And for, for you, I would like to ask, what are three screenplays that every screenwriter and filmmaker should read? Wow. Um, that's a good, really good question. I think one of my favorite screenplays uh, is Chinatown. Yeah. I think just in terms of being a classically structured, incredible thing, um, that's so resonant. I love that. <laughs> I would say uh, The Fighter, the original draft, Scott's original draft, which is different than the movie, has an entirely different first act. It's such a joy to read, and it's really interesting to read that and then see the movie and see what they kept in and what they changed, what, what, how much that would have changed. It's like a master class in that. Um, I mean, I think his script would have been equally as brilliant, if not maybe better. But the movie they had and, and seeing that, I think that that's that's phenomenal. And then the third, you know, one <laughs> look, it sounds corny, but I took that Robert McKee class when I was in my 20s. Hey, I just had him you, on. The, I just had him on the show. <laughs> no, I mean, I picked him up at the airport and drove him. I like got to because it was there for some film festival. and We chatted yeah. and I was like, Who the fuck is this guy? And, and you know, so much of his stuff was like so resonant. But when he really broke down Casablanca, um, yeah. you know what I mean? I was like, oh, my God, I had no idea. Um, and reading that screenplay and seeing that movie it, it, and, and also having the Robert McKee sort of book to, to follow through, that was like a master class for me to do mm-hmm. that. So I would say those three, um, in terms of my personal like growth as a writer, were, were very, very influential scripts. And when and where can people see Small Engine Repair? So it comes out to, in theaters um, in uh, September 10th. And then it's on video on demand in, I think, early October. Okay. Very cool. So everywhere. It'll be, it'll, be, it'll be available everywhere. The video on demand, yeah, is like, you know, I guess, you know, Apple and all that stuff. I, I've never really gone through this process, but it's like, uh, you know, Amazon, whatever. Wherever you get video on demand. Uh, Got it. They're really, it'll be everywhere. Which is, I mean, I, I watch a lot more video on demand now, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, and I would just say with the movie to people who are your listeners and stuff, which sounds like you have really cool film fans is like, you know, try to see it with a group of people. That's how it was intended to be. It would be really fun to see it uh, with that and everyone's different reactions and stuff like that. It's definitely a roller coaster. I think the movie is more in line of like we're talking about, um, you know, those films that like a Reservoir Dogs or Goodfellas or something you saw and it had that tension, that humor, but you really enjoyed seeing it with with people. John, man, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, brother. I wish you continued success uh, on your on your Hollywood journey and, and storytelling journey, man. So thank you again for uh, for making this film and for doing what you do, brother. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. You too. Keep at it. And I look forward to the next time. I want to thank John so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs and sharing his journey with the tribe. And I cannot recommend this film higher. It is one of the best films I've seen in all of 2021, and it's going to be available on September 12th 
in limited uh, limited theatrical run, and then shortly thereafter on VOD and everywhere else uh, you can download or watch films online. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 167. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly helps us out a lot. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 